colleagues don't know about because it's that new. It's brand new. So um, last or two weeks ago, uh, I chaired a new committee for the Department of Health called the UK Rare Disorders Registries and Databases Advisory Group. I want to call it the um, hang on, what do I want to call it again? Um, <laughs> oh yes, I want to call it the Registry of Registries for Rare Disorders and Databases Advisory Group. That it would be R two D two. Skywork. So I'm calling it the RD squared at the moment. Um, and so this committee has been created to try and address some of the issues that we're going to face because we need to, to create pooled knowledge in the UK, in the NHS, and we can do it far better than other countries because of our single NHS system. And I am very proud of the NHS, I've got my badge on, I'm on the board of the NHS now, so I've got to say that, haven't I? But basically the NHS, although we slag it off, is fantastic compared to most of the others. Winston Churchill once said the British government or British parliamentary system is the worst in the world except for all the others. And that's kind of what the NHS is like as well. In fact, when you look at the score recently on the Commonwealth Fund, we came out the best, NA, best health service in the developed world. Even though we say it's rubbish, you want to try some of the others. So basically, the NHS has got the capacity to solve some of these problems. And what I want to ask all of you now is your opinion on an idea that Jem Randbash and I have come up with. So Jem's on this committee with me, and he is a histopathologist by training. But he is now works for Public Health England. And he's been given the job by the government of responding to the European Directive on Rare Disease Management. The point was made earlier, how can you go to a GP with one of the 6,700 rare disorders listed in, in OpenNet and expect that GP to know what the nuance is of the management of that condition? The only way to do that is to have pooling of knowledge and to have a network for each of these classes of condition across Europe, not just across countries, because if you are just this morning talking to a lady from Estonia, you know, she is the geneticist, basically, that's got to cover all those diseases, so she needs help. And so the idea is that in Britain, what we will do is use the cancer registry system to create rare disease registries. So what you are not, probably not aware of is that for many years now, there's been a, a law that says cancer has to be registered. The NHS has to count cancers. Okay, so that we know, it. and that was mainly driven by industrial cancers and so on, when there were outbreaks of things like mesothelioma and so on from asbestos workers. So uh, it was made a rule that a register would be kept of all cancers as they happened. And it's drawn out of the medical records in every branch of medicine. And it's kept in one place. And, and what Jem's done is made that into a really very effective online secure database of all cancers. So what we're going to do is try to do the same thing for Lynch syndrome as a sort of model for other rare diseases and use our tracker systems in the NHS to pull the diagnoses of Lynch syndrome together. Now, the trick is that he knows how to do this because he's clever with computers. It will be anonymized. So we will know the identity in an anonymized form of everybody with Lynch syndrome in every hospital in the country. But it will be up to each of those individual people to decide whether they want to be made identifiable on the system. If you make yourself identifiable, then we can write you a letter and say, would you like to take part in CAP3 or something? But Because we can't do that at the moment. We haven't got a single register. But even if you don't want to be identifiable, your data can still be part of the follow-up study. can answer some of the questions you're asking, like how often do I need to have a colonoscopy? And what really is the risk of prostate cancer? Is it? We're not all that sort of prospective stuff that we don't actually know the answer to yet. So my question is to you, and I suspect you're all enthusiastic, I hope you are. I mean, how do you, how does that strike you all? Does that strike you like, oh, well, that sounds a bit scary, big brother, or about bloody time we thought you did it already? <laughs> <laughs> so does that seem like a sensible course of action? Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Keep clapping, I might need you. Okay? <laughs> so there are going to be people out there who are going to say, oh, this is dangerous. You know, what about Snowden? What about, you know, GCHQ? Blah, blah, blah. The good thing about the NHS is it is free at the point of need. You know, and basically it won't change. I guarantee it won't change. We might end up privatizing the laundry or something, but the fundamental principle of the NHS is you get looked after if you're in this country. Uh, and even if you're from outside this country, unless you're a UKIP member. That's enough problem. I withdraw that. 
<laughs> so, so basically, it isn't scary to let the NHS know who you are. If you're in America, and then what? Was that, was it, were you voting or it is scary? Yeah. It is scary to let the NHS know who you are. You should go. She's always trouble. Um, so basically, what we're hoping to do is, is make use of the power of the NHS in a way that it hasn't been used enough to actually link ourselves together and tell everybody the same story and try to unify our knowledge because we can become world leaders in this. Okay. So I'm now going to talk in my role as did I mention that I'm doing a study called CAP3? <laughs> Alright, so... Nobody knew. What? Nobody knew. <laughs> so Jill over there in the corner in the pink uh, top is uh, the research manager for our group uh, and Jackie who's sitting next to her in the orange top. Very fetching colour code there, though. Um, she is the uh, senior uh, research nurse who's doing most of the recruiting and will, will help others to get it going. So where this, this story began in Melbourne, uh, and this is Gabriel Kuhn, and, and I took this picture when I was down visiting him a couple of years ago, uh, and he was a physician in Melbourne, and he was studying bowel cancer, and he collected together a whole series of people with bowel cancer, and then he did what was called a case control study. So he collected people who didn't have bowel cancer and people who were just like them who didn't and compared their lifestyles to see what was different. And he noticed there was a difference in whether or not they were using anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin and brufen and things like that. Uh, and so he wrote a paper that said it would seem that people who take a lot of anti-inflammatory drugs have less bowel cancer. And that kicked off this huge cascade. That's what he looks like now, still going strong. That's after we got drunk in that restaurant. Um, so that's his paper at the top of this huge column. Now this is called a forest plot. And what this, the vertical line is zero line. So if you are, oh, what happened there? No, we got another one now. What? If you are to the left of the line, it means it's good. And if you are to the right of the line, it means it's bad. And as you can see, it was good that for every study, people who were taking a lot of aspirin were on the left of the line. They had less cancer than the people who weren't taking aspirin, except the Paganini Hill study, and they were very elderly Californians who we think are from another planet and don't count. <laughs> so, <laughs> apart from them, you know, everybody's on this side. Actually, the reason it might not work in elderly people, I'll come back to it again, there might be a real reason for that. But in the general population, it seems that taking a lot of these tablets <laughs> is good for you. So then people start doing lots of studies, and this is a collection, a so-called meta-analysis of four very large studies called randomized controlled trial trials, RCTs, where they either gave aspirin or dummy tablets to people, and just general people who had previous bowel polyps, not people with Lynch syndrome here, just the general population. And all of these studies put together suggested that if you took an aspirin a day, either a baby aspirin or a standard aspirin, then your chance of getting an abnormal was overall reduced by 17% which wasn't as good as the sort of 50% cancer cut that those other papers were showing, but it did suggest that maybe the way aspirin's working is stopping you getting polyps, or at least one of the ways it works. Um, but it wasn't the kind of dramatic effect, but it did actually go in favour of the study. Then there was another series of papers which came out from Peter Rothwell, starting in 2007. So what Peter did, Peter used to work for the, he's, he's a, a stroke doctor, and he used to work for the original people who did the first studies using aspirin to prevent strokes. And he was able to get back to the original records of the people who took part in those very early studies of heart attack and stroke prevention to see what happened next to the people who had taken part. And it took a long time to get permission, but what they found was, that, and this was then, they did this across all of the studies that were done in the 1980s and early 90s, is if you follow people who once took aspirin and compare them to the people who took the dummy tablets, there is clearly a difference in those two lines. And it doesn't happen straight away. It takes about five years to kick in. And in about five years, the people who were on the aspirin go straight on, and the people who were on the placebo tablets turn left. So the lines diverge. And that's a statistically significant difference. There were 21% fewer bowel cancer deaths in people who had been given aspirin for only about four years, typically, in those early studies. And otherwise, they, were just, they just went back to their normal lives. So that's very powerful. It's not the absolute power, however, because it, this, this study wasn't set up. These studies weren't set up to test for cancer. They were st set up to test for heart attacks and strokes. So this was a secondary observation. So in the, in the purest world, it's not the absolute answer, but it's very encouraging. So what we did uh, back in the early, two, the early 1990s 
was focus on people with hereditary bowel cancer. We started with familial polyposis, which you saw earlier, then we switched to Lynch syndrome, which is easier to work with in CAT2. And the idea was that people who have Lynch syndrome are highly motivated to find out ways of stopping it because they've got families with this, so it isn't just for themselves, it's for their next generation as well. They're already under surveillance, so theoretically it's a lot cheaper to keep in touch with them. They have the same cause. They haven't got a million different reasons. They've got a particular genetic cause, so they're homogeneous. And because a lot of them are going to get problems, going to get cancers, you don't need as many of them to see an effect. So if you took general population, you'd have to follow thousands of people for lots and lots more years to see an effect than you would with Lynch syndrome. And so we first of all called it the Concerted Action Polyp Prevention to get money from the European, action, European Union's Concerted Action Program. And we liked the, the logo so much we stuck with it. And it's now called the Cancer Prevention Program. And I, I have to take out the slide saying it's named after Andy Cap because I'm the only one old enough to remember who Andy Cap is, which is rather sad. Anyway, um, Andy Cap, for those of you who are too young to remember, was born in 1953 in Hartlepool and he was a sort of a, a skyver who beat his wife and things and was a cartoon character in the Daily Mirror. Anyway, so Andy Cap is our, our patron saint. Um, so the CAP2 study, we found 1,009 people in 16 countries in 43 centres and we gave them two aspirins and the Navy. Is anybody in the room who did CAP2? Nobody here from CAP2. Well, they did all survive, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> they all made it. Um, so basically we randomised them to two interventions. One was aspirin and the other one was resistant starch, which is like green bananas because there, there is evidence that that indigestible carbohydrates are good for your colon. But that side of the study didn't give us a, a positive result, although I still think there's a story there to be had. But the aspirin initially was very disappointing. So when we published this paper in 2008, uh, we found that, in fact, it hadn't worked. We'd given two tablets a day for up to four years, and there was no difference in the number of cancers or the number of polyps. The good news was, as I said, we hadn't killed anybody. Um, there had been some uh, people admitted with GI bleeds out of those thousands. But in fact, interestingly, there were nine in the placebo group and 11 in the aspirin group. So in fact, even when you weren't taking aspirin, you can still get an ulcer. And that people kind of forget that. So, you know, the aspirin always gets blamed for the ulcer, but it's always the aspirin's fault. But that's about the rate you'd expect. You'd expect over a three or four year period, you know, one or two significant ulcers that mean somebody needs a, a transfusion or they need to go to hospital with it. Especially if you're dealing with older people and they're not... Uh, um, avoiding some of the obvious ways you can prevent ulcers, which I'll talk about at the end. But then we carried on following up. We, didn't, we ran out of money, but we kept going anyway because we planned to follow these people until 10 years. And so when the first of them reached their 10-year follow-up period, we looked again at the cancer rates. And that was this paper that came out in 2011, which Kevin referred to earlier. And what this showed was that two aspirins a day taken for a minimum of two years reduced your cancer risk by over 50%. So there were more, there's a more than halving of the cancer rates for all Lynch syndrome cancers, not just bowel cancer, in the people who were on the aspirin. And we're now doing a, a proper 10-year follow-up when the last of the people reach 10 years, and we'll be doing that this year. But this was an interim study I did in 2013. You don't need stats to look at this. You don't need a statistician to tell you this looks good. So there were 427 people who took two aspirins a day for two years. And among them, they had 25 new colorectal cancers. And there were 434 people who were taking two identical dummy tablets and otherwise had a, the same lifestyle, and they had 45 bowel cancers. Now, bearing in mind that in the first couple of years, we had 10 cancers in each group, so this is a delayed effect. So you can kind of say from two years out, there were 35 in the red line and 15 in the green line. So more than 50% reduction after the initial period. It worked. Okay? Now, interestingly, people dance on the head of a pin and say, oh, look, quite sure it might not be absolutely proof. But when you put this on the top of all that other literature, it works. It cuts your cancer rate. And people are sort of resistant to admit that. What doesn't work in terms of cancer prevention is colonoscopy. Because 434 people were getting 18 monthly colonoscopies and they had 45 colorectal cancers. So, we were a bit shocked when we thought that through, because what that means, we tell people, get your polyps taken out and you won't get cancer. But actually, in Lynch syndrome, you probably don't get polyps that cause cancer. In other words, you get polyps and you get cancers. But because they sort of pop out as cancers, they just appear uh, very quickly. And so taking polyps off doesn't prevent cancer. The good news is, you don't die of them, because, as I'll show later, bowel cancer in Lynch syndrome is different. 
it will appear quickly, but it stays put. So this, as long as you get a colonoscopy every couple of three years, you'll find it in time to remove it. It's very unusual for these cancers to spread outside of their location. So it isn't as scary as it sounds, but it does illustrate the point, A, that aspirin works, and B, that you can't rely on colonoscopy alone. Needless to say, colonoscopy is very bad at preventing kidney cancer. It doesn't prevent it at all. Whereas aspirin probably does. So, so it, you know, that's another point of view. There's only been one other study that actually, like CAP2, had cancer as an endpoint, and that was the Women's Health Study done uh, by Nancy Cook and colleagues in North America. And they had about 18,000 women, and they, these are just general population women, and they gave them vitamin E or a very low dose aspirin, 100 milligram aspirin, alternate days. So they were basically getting a, a mini a baby aspirin every other day. And when they published their paper in 2005, they'd seen no effect on cancer rates. But when, when they saw what had happened with, with our study and with uh, Peter Rothwell's data, they went back and tracked down those people again. And in the post-study, after 10 years, you can see the line separated. So they've seen the same effect, but the effect is smaller, 18% fewer cancers, and it took 10 years to kick in. So you could reasonably deduce from all this data two things. Aspirin works, but we're not sure how much to give you. These very low-dose studies are slightly safer than the bigger tablets, but they probably don't have as big an effect on the cancer. That's one possibility. Or it might be the people with Lynch syndrome are just more sensitive to aspirin. So even if you walk past one in the street, it might quit your cancer rate. <laughs> but we need to do a study to find the answer to that.